Hi everyone, my name is Amanda Koo and I'd like to welcome you to RGD's webinar, Choosing and Using Type, presented by Timothy Samara. Timothy is a New York-based graphic designer who splits his time between professional practice and teaching. He is a frequent lecturer and contributor to design publications both in the U.S. and abroad. Samara has written eight books on design that have been translated into 10 languages and are used by students and practitioners around the world. He is currently developing a book on type design, letter forms, to be released in April of 2018, and a visual history of graphic design. The expanded second edition of his first book, Making and Breaking the Grid, was released in June of 2017. Before we begin, a few reminders. If you have any questions, please submit them using the questions tab in the webinar control panel. Also note that questions can take a while to come through the system and are more likely to be addressed if submitted during the presentation. Questions that come through will be collected and answered by Timothy at the end of the talk. We also invite you to interact with us on Twitter by tweeting during and after the broadcast using hashtag RGDWeb. Welcome, Timothy, and thank you for coming. If you're ready, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, great. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm very delighted to be here, and I hope that what I will be showing you today will be useful for you, uh, just in general uh, knowledge building and also in terms of preparing for the certification exam. The typography questions uh, for the exam draw heavily on my book, uh, Design Elements, in particular the third chapter, which was originally released in 2006. Uh, I just want to point out that the book was updated and a second edition released in 2014 with expanded content and numerous other examples, but for the most part, the content in the book is uh, essentially the same, just digs in in greater depth. Uh, and with that, uh, then we'll begin. The first thing that we're going to talk about uh, here is the kind of the visual qualities of typography, uh, how it's uh, compositional, structural, and sort of textual qualities uh, give rise to what we would call visual interest and uh, also help to uh, differentiate information uh, in a page. Uh, we'll be talking about that uh, just sort of in a purely visual and sort of hypothetical sense. And then we're going to talk about how those visual qualities uh, influence uh, the creation of visual hierarchy, uh, that is the ordering of information and how readers navigate from point to point through a text. Uh, we'll be also looking at the interaction of type and image. And then uh, at the end, uh, just talking about some basic mechanics, uh, best practices for uh, extended text setting. So typography is essentially uh, driven by the relationship of positive and negative, that is form, where stuff is, and space, where stuff is not. Uh, it's this interaction uh, that underpins every kind of uh, typographic experience, uh, both at the macro level, from a basic sort of compositional and structural page layout standpoint, uh, down to the micro level, that is uh, the textual qualities, the spacing within text, and so on. Everything about typography uh, derives from this rhythm, this interplay between uh, positive and negative. And the first thing that we can talk about is how uh, forms, uh, whether they're typographic or uh, visual, uh, image-oriented, uh, change uh, space, or rather create a space once they're introduced into it. You never want to think about space as a kind of an emptiness or as a void, uh, rather that it is something that is created the instant that a form, a piece of typography, is placed into it. Once that happens, uh, as you can see in the upper left hand uh, diagram, is that that space is forever changed. Two new spaces are created, one above the typographic element or the form element and one below. As that element moves, its contours, its beginnings and ending points, its position in space, causes that space to be broken into new kinds of areas, uh, each with our own kind of visual uh, shaping and proportion and kind of emphasis. As that form decreases in size, uh, where its edge relationships become more apparent in contrast to uh, the edges of the format, 
the complexity and the kind of the nature of those spaces uh, is constantly changing. And you can see that that complexity grows uh, the more elements are introduced, uh, and then especially if there also happens to be rotation. It's very important to note always that the contours uh, that define the edges of typographic forms, the top edge, the lower edge, the left and right edges, that those things, uh, those contours create axes that actually extend past the ending points of that particular form element and begin to sort of optically interact with and engage the rest of the space. They start to govern that space beyond the point where the typographic element uh, ends. When you're arranging uh, material, uh, it's the voids uh, and their relationship to the mass elements, uh, which are you know, the type forms. Uh, that become kind of critical, whether or not that happens to be a very, very passive kind of configuration, as you're seeing on the left, in which all the type elements happen to be grouped, creating a very, very simple kind of a focus, uh, and yet still uh, creating these kind of spatial breaks, these kind of appreciably different sorts of spatial intervals and proportions, uh, or whether or not uh, the, uh, the type elements begin to be broken up and split apart. Uh, in order to call attention to particular elements, to institute hierarchy, and so on. You can see in the comparison between uh, the left and the right diagram how much more complex uh, those kind of spatial interactions become. On the right-hand side is a poster uh, that really demonstrates, you know, sort of how little information uh, is really necessary, how few gestures, how few kinds of shapes, being very, very specific, can start to articulate a vast amount of space and to control it. If you notice, uh, you know, sort of the, the dark spots uh, here in the upper right-hand corner, uh, here uh, in the titling element, here at a kind of a logo form at the bottom, this kind of triangulation. But if you begin to look at the shapes of the individual text elements. This very light co uh, column, for example, divides the space in such a way that in combination with the headline element is that the format's shape here is actually restated. And then, uh, and also effectively divides the format top to bottom more or less into thirds. There's also a kind of a restating of both the vertical in two different kinds of locations as well as a vertical space and horizontal spaces that are also playing with each other. Now these uh, kinds of alignment relationships can be extremely complex. Uh, and the more, uh, the more differentiated each element becomes, uh, the greater the changes uh, between elements in overall size and overall shape, the number, uh, an increase in the number of elements the more complex uh, those alignment relationships become. If you're looking here at the small diagram, you can begin to see these kinds of interconnections where negative spaces as well as positive elements begin to create this kind of armature uh, between uh, the various uh, parts, uh, sometimes aligning below, sometimes aligning across the format. And it's these alignments and the relationships, this interplay between where the voids are and where the masses are or the linear elements are uh, that will create kind of interconnectivity between the parts of the format from top to bottom, from left to right, and very, very often uh, kind of diagonally. You always wanna make sure that uh, you're conscious of the shapes of the spaces and how those spaces are brought into interaction with uh, not only other spaces, but also with the type elements themselves. You always want to be sure that the space is being activated, even spaces that are relatively empty or devoid of content material, somehow need to be brought into some kind of a dialogue with more complex or denser areas of information, such that those spaces don't become sort of a, a sort of a leftover feeling kind of empty and sort of disengaged or divorced from the visual activity created by the interplay of positive and negative in other locations. It's interesting that in this particular uh, book spread is that this very, very tiny typographic detail, which is the folio or page number, is 
really the only thing that serves to activate this lower space. You always want to be conscious of where typographic elements or groupings of them kind of align with each other that create optical boundaries that can bring visual movement and kind of involvement between parts of a format uh, into a kind of a, an anchoring point or to create a kind of a stopping point. Had these uh, page numbers been located, for example, towards the exterior, as is often quite conventional, this lower space may have seemed somewhat disconnected uh, from the upper uh, area of the layout, uh, and the composition would more or less have ended right below the bottom edges of the two columns. With this little point of uh, sort of detail, this tiny little dot, which is the page number. Now the vertical quality of that aligned edge is, is further pulled downward into that space. Uh, and that space now seems as though it is actually in some kind of dialogue with what's happening up above it. Uh, these diagrams kind of uh, borrow from the first chapter in Design Elements, which is really about form and space. Um, in general, and most of the material in that first chapter also applies uh, to typographic form, not just to image-related uh, form or sort of pure geometry and so on. And so I just like to bring this up as kind of uh, things to be conscious of. So in the upper left here, you're seeing uh, a kind of a space that's been cut off from the remainder uh, of the composition just by virtue of the fact that this linear element crosses the boundaries uh, from uh, the bottom edge of the format to the middle right-hand edge, uh, effectively creating a barrier that doesn't allow that space to kind of interact. The simple uh, strategy of allowing one of those, uh, one end of that line element to disengage from an edge will cause that lower triangular space to kind of bleed or begin to poke or flow into the space above. Another strategy, as you're seeing below, is to allow some element to cross that boundary so that the two spaces uh, on either side of it appear joined and therefore active, despite the fact that the boundary still exists in the same way. In the upper right-hand corner is a kind of uh, an example on a very abstract level of the same kind of sort of boundary uh, created by the alignment of objects as we saw in the book spread in the previous uh, screen. That is, these elements, the dot, the irregular plane, and the square, by virtue of their aligning, sort of force uh, a kind of a distinction or a differentiation of this space up above that becomes quite dead, uh, and as a result, very self-conscious. Simply allowing the lower element to extend slightly beyond, above the alignment of the dot and the square breaks that boundary and allows that space up above to now come into kind of a dialogue with the ones below it. Oops. So as soon as you're talking about uh, space and where things are and where it's not, is you have to take into account the sort of overall governing sort of compositional strategy that's in use. And there are basically two kinds. And the first is symmetry. Uh, that is where elements are uh, kind of identically mirroring each other uh, across a particular axis. In the top three examples, you have different kinds of bilateral symmetry. Uh, that is where elements mirror each other directly left to right or top to bottom or diagonally across an axis of the format. Uh, at the bottom uh, is another kind of symmetry, rotational symmetry, that sort of redistributes objects in mirror but in uh, kind of a quadrant formation or a, uh, a kind of a reverse mirroring top to bottom. Uh, and then in the lower right, a kind of a complex, a more complex situation where uh, it, there's still a, a two instances of bilateral symmetry, uh, but uh, involving two axes, uh, the central vertical axis of the format and also the diagonal one. Symmetry is a very, very direct uh, and straightforward kind of compositional structure, uh, but it comes with, uh, it brings with it some dangers, and that is uh, a kind of overt simplicity uh, that can sometimes cause uh, a viewer to kind of gloss over information because the structure is so similar in all directions or in both directions from left to right or top to bottom across the axis. Uh, it can also, uh, create limitations in terms of how information needs to be ordered uh, because it essentially creates a predetermined box, uh, a, a kind of uh, a level ordering system uh, that 
in which every single element has to participate regardless of its informational uh, relevance, regardless of uh, its uh, need for particular kinds of uh, treatment uh, in order to conform to that. Uh, so it's, it can be a, a kind of an unforgiving uh, sort of compositional uh, structure. On the other hand, you have the potential for different kinds of structure, uh, whether they're geometric or organic in nature. Uh, and those are asymmetrical kinds of structure. And here are a variety of different sort of structural uh, kinds of uh, approaches uh, that can be used to govern typography as well as other kinds of images. Uh, and of course, you know, context determines everything. Uh, if we're, you're working with an extensive text, if it's a multi-page document, of course, the, there will be some structural conventions that need to be considered. Uh, that is a column structure or a grid structure. Uh, conventions that aid in uh, navigating through that kind of long-form continuous information. Uh, but in one-offs like posters uh, or other kinds of print collateral where you're not looking at um, that kind of continuous text, uh, is that other kinds of geometric configuration are also possible. Uh, these are just two examples of asymmetrical structure. Uh, asymmetry, in addition to helping support the organic quality of information uh, and of being able uh, to provide flexibility for allowing each kind of informational component to occupy space and present itself in the way that is sort of fundamentally most useful, uh, or intrinsic to how that information needs to be uh, read is that it also tends to be far more dynamic uh, within the space, less restful. Uh, here are two examples on the left, uh, an asymmetrical structure that uses a diagonal structure uh, and one that is orthogonal or uh, oriented along the vertical and horizontal axes, and this one happens to be uh, grid-based. Mixing the two kinds of uh, structure can be a little bit dangerous because there's the potential for confusing the viewer uh, with the overall kind of compositional idea. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, and so if you're going to be bringing uh, asymmetry and symmetry together, it's very, very important that each kind of structure is kind of declared and given uh, enough sort of decisive presence that the deviation from it or the counterpoint to it uh, is, is very, very clear and somewhat limited. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see a diagram where there's an essentially uh, symmetrical structure uh, in the middle uh, that is broken uh, and contrasted by uh, two asymmetrical elements. Uh, in the lower left, you'll see an overall asymmetrical configuration with a lot of lateral movement, uh, sort of alignment stackings of objects. And then in the lower right corner of that uh, is this small cluster that acts as a kind of a soft, almost dot-like kind of counterpoint. Uh, and this particular page spread, uh, I like to show because it really sort of merges those two kinds of structure together well. Uh, on the left-hand side of the spread, the kind of the chapter opening material at the top of the hierarchy is ordered in a very, very classical, uh, somewhat straightforward vertical, a uh, vertical axis bilateral uh, symmetrical configuration. But on the right-hand side, we have a kind of a mixture. Uh, a generally sort of centralized location for the column of text, uh, but then an asymmetrical relationship between its margin to the left and its margin to the right, um, where both symmetrical elements, that is the, uh, the book title and the chapter number, uh, is arranged symmetrically within that narrow column of space, and then a uh, caption uh, at the bottom is arranged uh, flush right asymmetrically. So in addition to uh, the kind of the spatial relationships and this interplay of positive and negative between uh, masses and voids, uh, is that we also have to talk about uh, color, that is uh, the kind of the rhythmic and textual quality of the type. Uh, when people talk about typographic color, they're talking about everything except for uh, what we identify as chromatic color. So we're not talking about hue uh, or saturation. What we're really talking about is mass to line relationships, mass to texture relationships, uh, and also gray value relationships, uh, as well as uh, rhythmic uh, relationships. That is, what is tighter together uh, and seeming sort of compressed in its rhythm, and what is more loosely spaced or open or expansive in its rhythm. And these two 
uh, examples uh, on the left, a kind of the masthead area of uh, a tabloid publication uh, and a web page on the right, uh, make use of extreme contrasts in typographic color, uh, despite the fact uh, that they're both uh, produced only using uh, values of black uh, against a white field, is that we would refer to these as being extremely colorful typographically. Typographic color uh, can be used in a very, very subtle way. Uh, it's the thing that really, that really differentiates typography as an idea from sort of prosaic writing. Uh, that is kind of a basic sort of text document presentation uh, and a kind of an enlivened visual experience of the language uh, in a kind of pictorial uh, uh, visual way. Um, it can be used uh, simply to create uh, differentiation uh, between uh, major groupings, uh, that is uh, sort of what you're seeing in the upper uh, left uh, examples, um, and these are uh, some student works, uh, where the changes in density, uh, changes in uh, mass, and changes in lightness and darkness value really just serve to uh, create a little bit of emphasis, uh, some differentiation between major blocks of text. Uh, it can be used in a very, very subtle way simply uh, to uh, distinguish, uh, say, a point of interest or a point of focus uh, between um, a small detail of information like an attribution, as in uh, the slight bolding uh, of uh, Marshall McLuhan's name, the author of the text that you're seeing. But it can also become uh, an extremely uh, expressive and rhythmic experience that not only helps engage uh, a reader with the text on an intellectual and kind of visceral experiential level, but can also support meaning within the text as uh, the kind of ex uh, compressing and expanding uh, of, uh, uh, of the type styles uh, in this uh, more uh, dramatic sort of graphical presentation is doing. There are a lot of different kinds of things to think about when you're uh, dealing with typographic color. It can have a dramatic effect simply by changing uh, you know, sort of these uh, mass to line or darkness lightness relationships. Uh, on the left hand uh, column, you'll see three iterations of a postage stamp design. The overall layout, the size relationships, the spacing relationships are fundamentally the same, uh, but you'll see that, uh, you know, swapping out a lighter weight for a darker weight uh, between uh, or among. Uh, the various elements will create different kinds of presence and also different relationships. Um, you know, the similarity of the weight overall uh, between the word Jakarta and the number 75 uh, in uh, the middle example uh, creates now a new kind of interconnection between those two pieces of information. Gray value is essentially a function of how tightly compressed or loosely opened uh, the spacing within text happens to be. Uh, in the second column, you'll see examples of how the overall textual density, uh, its darkness versus lightness, changes uh, as its leading or interline space uh, increases from top to bottom. Uh, in the top example, uh, you know the, the, the textual quality as a field is somewhat dominated because the spacing is somewhat tight and more closely related in proportion to the height of the lower case. As the spacing opens up uh, and there's greater uh, uh, space between the lines, the actual lines themselves come to dominate and the overall field becomes less textural and a little bit more linear. The sizing of uh, a piece of text and its spacing uh, will uh, create very, very different kinds of relationships within a field. Uh, so in the middle examples from top to bottom, the word compression and its compression, uh, sort of colorfully, uh, creates very, very different readings of that text uh, and uh, as well a kind of different relationships uh, to the format. Uh, the overall shaping uh, of an element also comprises a component of its typographic color, uh, that is its presence as something that is proportionally more horizontal versus something more square-like or even in proportion, uh, depth to width, or more vertical. Uh, the right-hand column uh, of examples essentially shows a kind of changes uh, that occur uh, in meaning uh, between uh, different kinds of 
typographic width that is changes in style, which can also uh, radically alter the color of the typography. So from the compress, the condensed uh, type, uh, the condensed sans serif uh, at the top uh, of the word compression, which is a little bit more direct and literal, uh, you know, sort of recreating the sense of that word and the visual uh, impression of it uh, versus the expanded or uh, extended uh, versions, uh, which either touch the edges of the format or expand beyond it as a kind of uh, a, a visual opposition to the meaning of the word. And the bottom is a kind of a combination, again, of multiple uh, texture, uh, multiple widths, uh, all set within the same type family. Uh, one to maintain overall unity, uh, but to emphasize uh, the kind of the meanings uh, within each of the words or each of the individual phrases. And these are just uh, some additional examples, uh, you know, showing sort of uses of color in very, very complex ways. Uh, on the left, a po uh, poster uh, by Ludovic uh, Ballant uh, of Switzerland that uses a kind of a progression uh, or an, uh, a repeating progression of kind of large and massive to sort of medium and kind of linear down to small and textural, and then a repetition of that again. Um, uh, in the upper right, uh, a similar kind of pushing and pulling, uh, both laterally, horizontally, as well as from top to bottom, uh, to emphasize and enhance uh, the lateral uh, movement of the text as it uh, starts and stops at different points within the composition and breaking the space. Uh, and then uh, below in a very, very simple way uh, as a means of enlivening uh, a very uh, uh, direct uh, and generally textural small scale uh, kind of uh, symmetrical arrangement. You always wanna be conscious of uh, transparency and the illusion of spatial depth as a component uh, not only as a component, but as a result of what will happen uh, to changes in typographic color. Uh, you can think about uh, space as being uh, a kind of a field uh, that is where all of the elements interact in a kind of a landscape or sort of an environmental quality, uh, or where those elements kind of resolve themselves into a kind of a cluster, what might be uh, called a kind of a singularity within that space. And the space, of course, can also be very, very deep uh, in an illusory way. Uh, and that's usually accomplished with greater uh, changes in uh, uh, texture or typographic color, uh, or it can be quite shallow, uh, which usually results from uh, a lesser degree of contrast in typographic color. On the right hand is uh, a brochure cover uh, in which there's a, a tremendous amount of spatial ambiguity, in particular the small paragraph of text, which theoretically, because it's so small compared to the massive blue uh, line element, should theoretically read uh, as a background element, as smaller, more textural elements tend to recede in space, and larger, more massive elements tend to advance in space. But in this case, uh, there's a kind of a question, uh, simply because there's a clever little overlap uh, that's provided for that text over the, the large form. And so its sort of identity as a background or foreground element is thrown into some question. Typographic color, of course, uh, involves uh, stylistic, uh, uh, attributes, that is the choice of typeface itself. And so, uh, you know, kind of the micro level, uh, the texture of the typeface uh, will bring a certain kind of overall darkness or lightness, as well as a certain kind of sharpness uh, or roundness or some uh, sometimes a more compressed or more expanded quality, depending on uh, its uh, edge drawing, uh, its the details of its serifs or lack thereof. Uh, and so on. And you always just want to be really careful about how you're choosing your typefaces. Uh, generally, uh, it's not a great idea to mix uh, two typefaces or two type families of very, very similar uh, stylistic category. Uh, you want to think about the visual relationships uh, in terms of the widths of, you know, the sort of overall body widths or proportions of the typeface, as well as kind of similarities in detail, similarities in counter shape and so on, as well as overall weight uh, to develop a kind of a palette that has some clear 
uh, and very, very distinct relationships in terms of its texture or color, uh, as you can begin to see in uh, the middle uh, set. Uh, you know, in the top set, it's really about weight distinction. Uh, in the bottom set, it's really about sharpness and the degree of contrast between uh, strokes. Uh, in the right-hand set, uh, it's about dot to line relationships. The bold extended sans serif uh, is very, very dot-like in its form, whereas the condensed lightweight sans serif below it uh, is uh, extremely linear in its form. And that relationship becomes hyper-exaggerated uh, and really sort of called attention to when the scale between those two different kinds of type style are changed. Typographic color can be, uh, of course, a great way of giving voice uh, to different parts of a text. Uh, in this particular uh, layout, various characters that are in dialogue with each other are each characterized by a different type, uh, uh, by a different type style, different kinds of spacing settings, uh, different access relationships. Uh, and then those things are tagged with other kinds of elements that exhibit uh, contrast in color in order to differentiate those uh, at a, uh, to a greater uh, degree than uh, is uh, occurring visually between uh, the different parts of the dialogue. And that brings us then to the issue of informational hierarchy, uh, which, in essential, uh, which essentially uh, is about uh, establishing kind of an order of importance uh, among levels of text, providing uh, a, a reader or a viewer with an entry point, a place to begin navigating, uh, as well as to uh, help them appreciate the meaningful relationships between different parts of text. There are some things about hierarchy that, uh, again, uh, really sort of attend all sorts of visual uh, material, whether it's typographic or not, uh, and sort of these are those. Uh, and what you're really looking at is, uh, is uh, relationships of contrast, you know, how different something is from the surrounding elements uh, and to what degree it's different. Uh, in the first uh, column, uh, you see uh, at the top a kind of a simple distinction in hierarchy, that is there's one element which is different from all others, uh, but the eyes on the brain are able to pick through multiple layers of distinction, uh, as you can see in the lower example. Uh, in which each uh, kind of grouping uh, is uh, differentiated not only by line weight, but also by levels of gray value. Uh, generally, things that are closer together uh, will appear more related than things that are uh, further apart, and things that are of wildly different size will be uh, sort of distinguished as kind of groupings. Uh, in the second uh, column uh, of examples, you can see uh, an overall cluster that is quite large in scale versus a grouping that's small. Uh, but simply by changing uh, the gray value of several of those elements, a relationship can be established between the two major groupings. And you always have to think about the fact that typography uh, you know, occurs at these two kinds of levels. The macro, that is the kind of the big gesture, uh, breaking apart spaces, breaking apart major grouping, groupings of information. But then within each of those groupings, there's also a micro level. There are likely to be secondary and sometimes tertiary or quaternary hierarchies, each one requiring its own separate level of, of distinction uh, from upper level to lower level. In the fourth column, uh, I'd just like to point out that uh, if uh, the typographic color of specific kinds of information or specific levels of information is dramatic enough, it really doesn't matter where those elements appear within a space. The brain will group those things by virtue of the fact of their similarity to each other. Uh, so in the lower example, uh, you see that the bold uh, horizontal lines uh, all appear uh, kind of as a simultaneous unit. The three lightweight diagonal lines appear as a kind of a unit, and the three uh, light gray dots also appear as a unit, despite the fact that their locations uh, are being, uh, or their, their unity is being interrupted by the, uh, the other elements. Uh, and the last thing to always consider is that whenever you provide uh, an entry point, uh, is that the, the eye is going to try to follow a path. And that path is usually in terms of kind of descending order of similarity. 
So the eye will go to immediately to the thing that is most different uh, from all other things within the space. Uh, it will then look for the next closest thing uh, in terms of its visual similarity to the point of entry. And that can be uh, a relationship of similarity in size, similarity in weight, and very often proximity. And very often those kinds of uh, similarities are being, uh, are working together. Uh, at the bottom is a kind of a, a map uh, for uh, the reading di direction or the eye line path uh, that a reader will follow uh, after uh, entering into and locking onto the large dot. And I always like to point out that hierarchy, uh, especially uh, with typography of a simpler nature, fewer parts, not long continuous text, can be very, very heavily manipulated. Uh, you don't necessarily have to start your hierarchy at the upper left of a format simply because reading order or expected reading order for uh, extensive text uh, falls along that uh, line or travels in that direction is that with careful control of the visual attributes of color and composition, uh, it is possible to cause a reader to enter into uh, a typographic field at any location and to move their eye around in almost any direction. The basic kinds of levels of differentiation or the strategies uh, for uh, uh, establishing hierarchy with typography specifically are these. Uh, you know, uh, a change in size, a uh, change in weight, a change in alignment, and these are generally the three sort of basic go-tos uh, that most designers uh, will invoke. Uh, then there's change in rhythm, that is uh, things being more tightly or loosely spaced, uh, changes in spacing, uh, change in width or posture, uh, and usually these are uh, more micro-level uh, qualities that occur within text, that is the change from Roman to Italic, or from uh, a regular width to something more uh, condensed or extended for emphasis, uh, followed then by change in orientation. Um, generally, any piece of text that is set right reading along horizontal baselines uh, will always read before any text that has been rotated in its orientation, uh, even if there's a dramatic size change. Uh, change in gray value, uh, and that really depends on kind of the background relationship. So against uh, a darker background, uh, darker text will merge with that uh, background and lighter text will advance. Uh, against a light background, uh, lighter text will recede into space uh, and darker text will differentiate uh, itself more uh, clearly. Uh, at the upper right is a, a page layout that makes use of actually all nine of those uh, strategies simultaneously uh, for different levels of information uh, from uh, the very, very bold and dark uh, value headline uh, to the uh, uh, sort of darker level of text uh, in the column immediately to the upper right of it uh, to the mid-level value uh, text, which is the large quotation, uh, which is also uh, merging with uh, the background illustration by virtue of its uh, similarity in value, and then you have uh, a rotation uh, of material of uh, far secondary or uh, even lower level importance on uh, the left. Uh, and that just really sort of calls to mind that you know any kind of contrast strategy, uh, even those that generally uh, attend uh, image material are also useful kinds of strategies to consider when trying to differentiate typographic material uh, or the levels of different kind of type elements from each other. Uh, and there are hundreds of different kinds of uh, contrast relationships that very often uh, are used uh, in combination. Uh, and these are uh, a number of those from, you know, the confrontation of dot and line uh, to curve and angle, light and dark, of course, and then down to the more textual ones, hard and soft, uh, elements that are geometric uh, versus organic in quality or character, uh, regularity versus irregularity, uh, things that are flat or textural, uh, and so on. I always like to say that there's more than one way to uh, bake, a, uh, decorate a cake, or to butter an elephant. Uh, you know, very often as designers, we're provided. Uh, with a sort of a desired hierarchy that is a client gives us text and outlines for us 
uh, what they feel the hierarchy should be, what should be the entry level, what should be the most important, second most, and so on. Uh, but generally, we often have, uh, even despite that, some leeway in interpreting uh, for the viewer uh, what information ought to be called out uh, in advance. Uh, and so these are just three examples of the same uh, groupings of five or six levels of information uh, that each organize uh, themselves in a way that calls attention uh, to some uh, kind of informational relationships more clearly and downplays other relationships. All the information uh, in uh, each of these uh, layouts uh, is essentially uh, equivalent in terms of its raw value, uh, but by breaking the space in different ways, by creating different proportions uh, between the elements, uh, sometimes wider uh, kinds of proportion versus more narrow, by looking at how close together or for, far apart uh, those elements are uh, as separated by spatial intervals. So the designer here is able to focus our attention at uh, different levels at different times. Uh, and the same thing uh, is happening here. Again, uh, these are a, a series of hand uh, cut and paste studies uh, really using the same sizes, the same weights, uh, the same uh, combination of serif and sans serif typefaces uh, in uh, all four. Uh, but you can see sort of the radical uh, change in effect in terms of emphasis uh, uh, that the designer is able to achieve simply by positioning. I'd like to call attention just briefly to uh, the first one at the far left is that here the title of the book, um, and these are book cover designs, uh, is uh, given uh, is actually dropped in prominence simply by virtue of the fact that it has been rotated uh, and that uh, the bold uh, larger sans serif treatment of uh, the artist's last names uh, has been given prominence uh, by virtue of the fact that it appears uh, at uh, more or less the upper left of the grouping, uh, that it is a, a sort of hanging from or riding along uh, a defining spatial break uh, between the upper and lower part of, of the format and so on. Uh, here again, uh, you know, just sort of regularity versus irregularity. Uh, the brain is likely to, to group the two callouts at upper left and lower right, simply because they are really the most radically different uh, in terms of proportion, in terms of overall weight compared to the text, which is relatively continuous and of similar value, um, mostly vertical in its shape, uh, you can see this kind of secondary level of, uh, of typographic color distinction with the subheadings uh, in the columns uh, on the right-hand page of this spread. And then there's this other kind of freeform element, the word blue, which has been broken up uh, in a more organic or irregular treatment. And weirdly enough uh, is that uh, even though it is sort of the title of uh, this particular spread, it's given a secondary uh, kind of quality simply because it establishes less contrast value with the overall background, this kind of wash of color as compared to the strong value contrast established by uh, the, uh, the quotations at upper left and lower right. Here on the left, uh, a very, very uh, kind of flat uh, or shallow spatial uh, kind of experience. Uh, where the hierarchy is really determined by changes in gray value. Almost everything is essentially linear in its texture. Uh, and then on the right, a very, very, very deep space that makes use of uh, an alignment distinction as well as uh, a size, weight, and uh, sort of gray value or uh, uh, darkness, lightness value distinction. And you'll see there's also a kind of a sharp uh, uh, a sharp to soft relationship, that is the image uh, in the background, which is extremely active, uh, is also quite blurry, so it sort of falls uh, into sort of merging with the background uh, and allows the sharpness of the text itself to really situate itself up on the surface. Uh, again, uh, you know, complexity is something that uh, one we often have to deal with uh, on a functional level, but sometimes that complexity is also part of the sort of the stylistic gesture or the kind of the conceptual language uh, that designers would like to work with. And generally here, there's so much visual activity uh, that the eye is going to be drawn essentially to the most open, most simple, most uninterrupted uh, sort of free area, which is 
the two text elements, uh, bold text elements at the top of the page. And then from there, the brain will look for the next different thing, which is a similar size weight treatment for the list of names that occurs. And then it'll start to dig into the smaller elements after that. Here's an interesting situation. This is a, a student composition uh, that uh, just sort of calls out, you know, the different structures are possible uh, aside from a kind of column-based uh, orthogonal structure. Uh, it's very interesting to note, again, that elements that are treated in a similar way will hold together as a unit, even if they are interrupted by or separated by other elements. So if you look at the phrase New York City, which reads very clearly as a consistent phrase, uh, it's been interrupted by this, these very, very light linear uh, elements in between, but because their typographic color distinction is so strong, uh, is that there's really no question about the reading order. Here's a, you, you, the, visual, uh, the visual hierarchy of image material often helps support uh, typographic hierarchy, and here is a kind of a breakdown of three major uh, hierarchic levels. Uh, that are really supported, uh, you know, at the primary or top level by the massive quality of uh, the large dots uh, and uh, the sort of train illustration, the horizontal thing, which is really the only horizontal element uh, within uh, the frame. The secondary level and the tertiary level are then uh, the sort of the steps down from that point. You can always look to uh, the structure of language itself as uh, both a source for uh, applying typographic color, uh, but noting that any changes to uh, the color of individual words or phrases within uh, a, uh, a text will invariably uh, and unavoidably change the hierarchy, as well as the appreciation of sort of uh, what the text is emphasizing. So on the left, uh, the changes in typographic color and arrangement emphasize the reader's context, our time startling discoveries. Uh, the middle one emphasizes conceptual meaning uh, in uh, affecting this kind of constant change uh, from line to line to line in color, as well as lateral movement back and forth. Uh, it expresses this idea of this kind of probing or uh, investigation. Uh, and then on the right, uh, the application of typographic color changes the hierarchy to emphasize the verb formations, crossing, erasing, probing, and then the result of that discovering or discoveries. Whenever you're mixing uh, elements for visual interest, uh, especially if you're using different kinds of typefaces in combination in order to create distinctions between levels or kinds or meanings of information so you have to think about not only how they're distinguishing from each other, but also how they unify with each other. On the left is uh, a first attempt uh, by a student to create a very, very lively and highly sort of conceptually differentiated treatment uh, to kind of give voice to different kinds of qualities or ideas related to groupings of text uh, and what they represent. Um, but sort of stylistically, there are so many different sort of typefaces involved that don't share any relationships with each other uh, that it's kind of hard to kind of appreciate the entire composition as something that's a, a unified totality. On the right, on the other hand, those distinctions remain, but now all of the typefaces share uh, one, uh, a kind of an idea about weight change. Uh, they're all serifs, and in fact, uh, there are now only four different typefaces uh, in use, whereas in the previous one there are um, uh, six or seven. Hierarchy happens at different scales depending on contexts, uh, and therefore also the color relationship. Uh, between each of those levels will change. Sometimes in a poster or in a large scale kind of environmental exhibition work, uh, you're really only looking at two or three levels of typographic color, uh, and the distinctions between those tend to be very, very extreme. When you're looking at a book, on the other hand, uh, you know, regularity rather than strong distinction is important because you're really trying to lull uh, the reader into a state of kind of focus and concentration. And then very, very small changes uh, are all that are required in order to elicit 
uh, kind of distinction between the parts. Um, and those changes need to be uh, kind of restrained at that level in order to not interfere with sort of the continuity of reading. So, you know, you always have to look at kind of what the context of use is uh, in terms of uh, the use of uh, color. Uh, but very often, sometimes those two kinds of scale come into play, especially when you're dealing with typography uh, in an exhibition design. That is, you're looking at a very, very poster-like, sort of large-scale, uh, bold, highly distinctive set of levels uh, in terms of scale. Um, you know, for the kind of the big picture, and then as the user or the reader, or the participant comes closer to uh, sort of points of interest within uh, the exhibition areas that that more kind of book level complex subtle scale uh, uh, of color comes into play uh, as it does on the right. You can see the kind of the distinction of sort of uh, foreground to background relationship established between overall wall graphics and then the sort of inset kind of element where the levels of typographic distinction become uh, highly reduced. And then, of course, you can never sort of ignore color. Color can immediately uh, reinforce and support a hierarchy, or it can completely destroy it. Uh, in the uh, upper level, uh, or in the upper uh, example, you'll notice that, in general, the application of color, that is hue distinctions, changes in value, relationships of greater or lesser saturation, relationships of closer or further or more analogous or less analogous temperature uh, around the color wheel actually allow the sequence of numbers one, two, three, four, five to be read in their expected order, whereas in the lower example they don't. And again, on the, in this uh, web page on the right, you know, the greatest contrast in color difference that is between the cooler colors and of the sort of the blue, blue violets, blue greens, and uh, their kind of complementary opposites, uh, the yellow green, uh, forces attention on those elements that are at the top of the hierarchy and then through a kind of a stepping down from greatest color distinction to least color distinction is that the reader is directed through uh, the, the hierarchy. I see that we're running a little bit uh, longer than uh, expected, uh, so hopefully um, that'll be okay. Uh, if you need to chop me off, Amanda, I can go a little bit more quickly. Uh, but this next section is really about the interaction between the purely visual and the purely verbal. And I'll try to move through this uh, a little bit more uh, heavily. Uh, I find that you know whether you're talking about students or uh, seasoned designers is that creating clear, strong, and compelling relationships between typography and imagery is one of the most challenging aspects of designing with type. Uh, and the question really comes down to how are you thinking about the typography as it relates to the overall image language uh, you know, that's being uh, expressed by images. And so I always like to ask uh, people this question, uh, looking at the layout on the left, uh, and the question is, what are those three things, uh, these uh, three uh, items uh, that you see? Uh, what are the images? Uh, and uh, most of you, and probably uh, generally this is the initial reaction, is uh, they're twigs, they're grass. And you know, students that happen to cook will recognize those as rosemary. And they'll be like, rosemary, the answer to which uh, is no, they're not. They're lines. They're only lines. They're vertical lines. They're relatively dark value lines. They are lines made up of a structure of internal lines with a great deal of contrast and light and dark, but they're only lines. And this is the critical factor in determining how to create relationships between type and image. And that is to look at image material sort of devoid of its content or its meaning and only in terms of its sort of pure geometry or its kind of formal identity. Is it a dot? Is it a line? Is it a plane? Is it geometric? Is it irregular? Uh, is it regularized? Uh, and so on. In looking at that, uh, you'll see then that there is also, you know, so here you have a system of three vertical lines uh, that are rising and lowering. They are running in parallel uh, and they have different kinds of levels within the format. And if you look at the headline component, the descriptor, and the sort of secondary level, you're also looking at three lines. 
even though these lines are also made up of groupings of things, uh, they are essentially three lines. They move back and forth laterally in the same way that the vertical lines of the image move up and down. And you'll see that there are situations where that same kind of dark to light alternation or contrast as occurs in the image is applied uh, in terms of typographic uh, color in order to create hierarchic distinction, uh, but also to create greater visual dialogue between the typography and the image. Uh, typography is always lines. It's always lines of some mass or less mass more uh, sort of shape oriented at larger sizes or textural at smaller sizes. Uh, and so you have to um, you know, sort of bridge the gap between sort of how consistently similar type always is and how radically different and varied images are. And again, that comes down to finding essential geometry. I'm gonna ask over here, you know, what is this? Uh, and so hopefully all of you are looking at it and saying, oh, that's a dot and not saying it's an artichoke. Uh, it happens to be a dot joined to a line. We could also think about this as an ellipse. So the central axis of that gives rise to a kind of an anchoring point against which this lateral push and pull and the titling element is arranged. There's a relationship between that center axis and its line to dot relationship that is also expressed at the micro level between the dot and, or the line and the dot or tittle of the lowercase i. There's a relationship of complexity and organicism to simplicity and geometry that is irregular versus regular. The joint between the two major forms, the dot and the line, is a place where a piece of uh, type is hanging from. You always want to be conscious of the axes between things. And so every element in this poster is somehow pointing at uh, one other element and also creating relationships and axis uh, from part to part between type elements, between type and image elements, uh, between those elements and the corners or proportions in the format and so on. Uh, so even as simple as the poster looks at a glance is that this complex geometry uh, is in evidence and you always wanna be striving for that kind of uh, complexity in the relationships. Uh, as you strip away complication in terms of numbers of elements or uh, numbers of treatments, uh, that is the more and more minimal the typography becomes, the more those relationships have to be super complex and spot on. Simple and complex are not opposites. They are, uh, one is required for the other to become interesting. Otherwise, uh, you know, if you don't have a kind of a complexity of typographic color, proportion, and axis relationships, uh, is that minimalism rapidly crosses the line from simple to dull. The same thing happens when you've got uh, typography within image, and here you can see a kind of a breakdown of that image into its kind of pure geometry uh, that's supported by the shaping and sort of axis and rhythms of the type forms. Uh, and so you can, you know, you can create relationships between type and image that in which the typography either kind of restates what the image is doing, uh, that is creates congruence between the formal characteristics of the type and the image as it is, uh, is occurring in these two examples, the poster on the left and the page spread on the right. Uh, or, uh, and I'll leave you uh, to really sort of analyze what those similarities or the kind of congruences are between the type and the image in both cases in terms of shape, in terms of compositional location, in terms of textual quality, in terms of movement, and so on. Uh, and then the other possibility is contrast or opposition, which is a completely valid relationship to establish between type and image. Uh, and again, I'll leave you uh, here uh, with a little bit of a note, you know, on the left hand side, the image is essentially lacking in value distinction, is lacking in texture, in, is lacking in complexity of contour, and the type is all about the opposite of that. Uh, but then I'll leave you to kind of pick apart uh, the kinds of relationships that uh, are being established between type and image uh, to create contrast and opposition in the poster on the right, which is quite active. You know, type and image, if they are separate uh, within the space, 
do very, very different things to that space than they do if they are, you know, sort of sharing those areas. And that's always an, uh, you know, an important kind of a consideration is when the type and the image uh, are separate and, you know, sort of emphasize their sort of individuality of, uh, as sort of planar elements, you know, operating on the surface and emphasizing that surface rather than deep space versus when those things begin to trade uh, positions where foreground and background begin to become joined by virtue of the typography, crossing boundaries or being located inside of an image versus outside and so on. You always want to be looking at sort of how spatial breaks, uh, in particular these uh, kinds of margin areas begin to correspond uh, and hang lines of things begin to correspond with sort of major horizontals or helps begin to restate uh, the kind of the shapes of elements that are in images, um, the sort of the squareness of the block here that's also being picked up by the squareness of these uh, sort of cluster of shapes on the side. Uh, crossing the boundaries again, here are some uh, page spreads for, uh, they're both uh, tables of contents from the same book. These are uh, student works, you know, where different kinds of strategies for kind of crossing that boundary, uh, introducing just a kind of a, a uh, a simple typographic element, a titling element, uh, to pick up on the image's uh, diagonal uh, horizon and then kind of relate that to that movement on the right-hand side where the type is completely separate. Here, the kind of the arcing quality uh, joins these two elements by virtue of their overall scale and similarity of visual treatment compared to everything else which is linear and horizontal or orthogonal. And then you really have to sort of think about the entire visual language and how those things are being integrated. Uh, these are two spreads from an annual report, which in essence, uh, you know, sort of break apart the space into a set of sort of vertical channels or columns uh, with uh, strong uh, sort of scale and also color sort of linkages uh, between major elements of entry, major elements of focus uh, in each case. Um, so that all of those parts kind of integrate as a totality. Again, there's these two spreads exhibit one kind of rhythm overall, uh, the sort of upward downward motion in the vertical elements, and then these sort of punctuating uh, kind of bits, which may be circular or linear or uh, square-like in configuration. Uh, and this poster I find fascinating as a kind of a, uh, an ending point for uh, that discussion is because uh, the typographic elements uh, become image elements as well as hierarchic differentiators. Uh, that is that you always keep in mind that type consists not only of letters and numerals and text blocks, but also the things that make them, that is lines and dots and planes. Uh, and those lines and dots and planes can become image-like. Uh, that is, for example, here where the black and white vertical lines become a kind of a reference or an allusion to the keys uh, of uh, an organ, a keyboard. Uh, but at the same time, they're being used in a kind of hierarchic, uh, hierarchic way uh, to call attention to two major pieces of important information. Um, and then they also participate in a kind of a system of breaks in space from larger and deeper at the top to kind of a middle uh, proportion, a shallower proportion towards the bottom, shallower still, and then another again. And you'll see again these kinds of alignments between very, very specific uh, contours or axes of the type and those things. At the same time, you have a counterpoint, which is this vertical column element that creates a kind of uh, a rhythmic movement of verticals from the top, which is uh, established by the pipes as image, is crossing that horizontal boundary in terms of the titling element and then comes to rest in the paragraph at the bottom. And then last from the kind of the big picture stuff down to uh, the mechanics, that is the nitty gritty or the micro level. Uh, and so really just uh, kind of uh, a, a rapid overview of, you know, sort of issues to be aware of when you're setting text. The first is sizing. Uh, you want to be aware of uh, 
the kind of the differentiation in size that occurs between different typefaces when you're selecting them, when you're looking for a legible typeface is that, you know, simply because of the stylistic classification of a particular typeface, it's lower case, it's X height may be smaller or larger relative to the overall cap height and therefore create very, very different kinds of apparent size. Um, so the difference in size between 36 point Universe, 36 point uh, Garamond, and 36 point uh, Bodoni will be quite stark uh, at those sizes. You always have to sort of also take into account uh, the paper sub substrate and the process of printing, which generally expands uh, or bleeds the contour of the type and so tends to close up or sometimes clog the counter spaces that are required uh, for legibility. Um, and then, of course, you know, it's generally a good idea to try to use type families in which there are specific style variants that address different size uses. Uh, and that's becoming uh, much more common uh, these days with open type features uh, that allow for, you know, very, very complex kind of super families where you can have a size to be used as, uh, for captions, a size for regular text that would be between 9 and 13 points, uh, and then for subheadings or even larger sizes. And as you look at the differences here, uh, you'll see that as each size, uh, each kind of text, the caption, the regular, or the subhead size increases or decreases is that the text becomes a little bit lighter and a little bit more friendly or a little bit easier to read or a little bit more clunky, uh, depending on whether or not it's being used for its uh, the purpose for which it was designed or uh, not. I always like to talk about uh, the kind of the width of a paragraph uh, and its overall kind of qualities, uh, which has to do with character count. Uh, to determine its width and then also its interline spacing is to find a set of proportions or relationships between uh, how many characters are occurring on a line uh, before the brain kind of shuts off and gets lost. Um, and usually that turns out to be between 55 and 75 characters on a line. Uh, and it's a really good uh, way of establishing a basic kind of column width. Uh, which, you know, can be uh, a little bit less, a little bit more, and so on. Uh, you want to be really conscious about the space between uh, lines of text, taking into account, uh, you know, sort of how expansive the ascenders and descenders are, are the text and what kind of interference occurs, the general height of the lowercase, which increases density or decreases density, and will make that interline space a little bit more comfortable or less comfortable for reading. Uh, and in looking at those to try to find what I call the sort of the optimal paragraph, that is where the size of the text is uh, comfortable for reading, uh, where the spacing between uh, the lines allows for a clear uh, horizontal sequencing and focus on the beginning of the line to the end of it, where the rag shape is very, very regular, uh, the spacing within justified text is quite regular, uh, and when there's a minimum of hyphens. Generally, you'll find that in the character count range of between 55 and 75 characters, and this is for English only, uh, is that the rag shape and the minimization of hyphens becomes very, very apparent. Uh, and that's usually a kind of a nice clue to helping determine whether or not the sort of the setting for that, that kind of typeface, that size is really kind of optimal. The ragged edge always uh, drives people crazy. On the left is a well-crafted rag, even unforced ripple, even alternation from, uh, from shortest to longest lines in a recognizable range. Uh, and then on the right uh, are two examples of very, very poor rags, uh, long lines that poke out, deep inclusions of space that jut into the text, um, uh, changes in the overall apparent width of the column from top to bottom, uh, bulges, uh, really recognizable shapes, and really what you're after is a kind of a, an unforced and undifferentiated sort of fringe of texture that's, that's enough to allow the reader to know where the lines are ending, uh, but not enough to become a visual distraction. And generally that tends to fall uh, in a kind of proportion that the difference between shortest and longest lines uh, is usually somewhere between one-fifth uh, uh, and one-seventh uh, the width of the overall paragraph or column. Uh, you can see on the left uh, is that you get a kind of an even rag 
Here, uh, the last seventh is uh, of that width uh, is where the shortest and longest lines fall. Uh, in the other two, you have much deeper rags where the rag becomes extremely distracting, uh, where you're almost getting really an internal rag and an external rag uh, that begins to create some confusion in terms of where the lines end. Hyphens uh, play havoc uh, with developing a good uh, with uh, developing a good rag. Uh, generally, uh, you know, there are some designers that say, you know, no hyphens whatsoever, do whatever you have to do, but generally that off is quite limiting, uh, and uh, the result is usually an excessively deep rag if you force all the hyphens away. Uh, I generally tend to lean uh, to err on the side of the rag being the thing to look for. Uh, so if there's a hyphen every 10 to 15 lines or so, uh, that seems very, very accept uh, acceptable given that the trade-off is a rag that is as sort of beautifully crafted as can be. In terms of justified text, uh, regularity is the key. Uh, the spacing from line to line, the spacing from word to word, the word spaces themselves, uh, should be as regular, as undifferentiated as possible. Uh, and that's basically what's happening on the left. If you're ever setting justified text and any of the stuff that's happening on the right occurs, it means basically that the relationship of your character count, which is the size of the text and how many characters in that point size fit from left to right, uh, is not the ideal or the optimal relationship. That is that you're probably below or much higher than the 55 to 75 character count. Generally, you often find that, that uh, especially in justified text, um, that's not uh, well-crafted is that you get an excessive uh, hyphenation and a lot of rivering, that is chains of word spaces that begin to line up and lead the eye uh, from top to bottom vertically rather than maintaining a strong uh, consistent horizontal sequence. Whenever you're setting with a justification, then alignments within the text become super important for the crafting. So you want to make sure that usually you're using a baseline grid so that lines of text from one column to another are aligning with each other. You generally also want to look at hanging your punctuation so that you maintain a really, really strong geometric alignment because that's really what the, the sort of the goal or the quality, the characteristic of justified text is, is to have a kind of precise geometry to it, a cleanliness. Uh, and if the lines are not aligning with each other on the same baseline, if punctuation is creating these kind of indents and holes in the text, uh, is that those disturbances tend to kind of pop out as being somewhat sloppy. You always want to think about paragraph separation. There are 10,000 ways to separate paragraphs, of, of which these are just 12. Um, uh, and those are kinds of characteristics or kind of stylistic ideas that you want to think about in combination with the general overall stylistic quality of the text uh, in terms of its um, uh, sort of general rhythm and so on uh, throughout. Uh, but the paragraph break can be a very, very beautiful point of detailing uh, at the micro level to consider. Uh, and then you always want to think about um, the really, really detailed stuff that is spacing, uh, especially uh, punctuation like periods and commas, uh, semicolons and question marks. Uh, you know, always one space uh, following a period, never two. Uh, you always want to have a little bit more loose, uh, a little bit looser space between a comma and a semicolon uh, or a question mark and the text that it follows uh, to give it a little bit of room, not quite a word space. But then usually because those characters, especially the, the comma and the period and the semicolon carry a lot of space above them, is that usually following that the word space needs to be tracked a little bit more tightly. Italics in text usually need a little bit of attention to kind of match the rhythm uh, of the surrounding Roman. Uh, you always want to be careful with uh, brackets and parentheses and how they may crash against things. Uh, numbers in text, uh, parentheses in text uh, for uh, uh, italic text are really kind of best uh, styled as Roman so that they don't sort of jam into uh, the sort of ascenders or uh, the, the tails. And usually a really good uh, clue for sort of normal spacing 
uh, for a particular type style or font is to look at the ligatures uh, or other fixed width characters because those characters uh, have been designed with a very, very specific counter space between them that the designer has decided uh, is really the optimal spacing. If you start to tighten up the spacing, uh, uh, or loosen the spacing of the text too much, the ligature is going to pop out as being either tighter or looser because its spacing will, internal spacing will never change. There's always uh, then to think about how things are broken, whether it's uh, poor hyphenated breaks, uh, tiny little word ch chunks like the ER uh, or the LY. Uh, broken to another line or uh, a, a proper noun or a name uh, being broken from one line to another uh, in when you have columns and really pronounced uh, paragraph spaces uh, within those columns you always want to make sure that they don't line up with each other to create what's called the cross uh, which is incredibly distracting and which tends to encourage the reader to jump left to right uh, uh, across columns instead of continuing from top to bottom within the columns. And then, of course, there's the widows and orphans. There's are the leftovers, uh, you know, single line uh, or single words at the end of, uh, at the bottom of a paragraph, at the end of a paragraph, or a single line uh, at the top of a column after a return uh, right before a paragraph space. So usually um, the two rules of thumb there are uh, for last lines of a paragraph or column, uh, you want at least three words, but more ideally, uh, the last line should be a half uh, of the column's width. Uh, for breaks from top to bottom to get rid of orphans, you always want at the bottom of a column, three lines of text following a paragraph break before the text returns to the top of the next column, or once the, ter the text returns to the, not the, the top of the next column, three li full lines of text before the paragraph break uh, following it into another paragraph. Uh, and then last is really punctuation. I typically encourage hanging punctuation, bullets in particular, uh, but also quotations and dashes, uh, quotations and parentheses. Uh, again, to kind of ensure uh, the integrity of the aligned edge, the flush. Uh, don't ever use the bullets at their default size because they're usually too large and horsey. So you want to find a kind of an, a comfortable and kind of intrinsic weight relationship and even sometimes a shape uh, for the bullet that corresponds to the stylistic and weight-like qualities of the typeface. Know your dashes. There are three different kinds and they have specific uses. Um, usually the uh, one of the hallmarks of uh, an amateur uh, typographer is misuse of dashes. You want to style your small caps if they don't exist in uh, within the typeface or font that you're using, and usually they need to be a little bit bigger than uh, the kind of the electronically styled uh, small cap setting. Uh, so try not to use the the, the small cap button. Um, and then, you know, analphabetic symbols and glyphs, because they're not letters, uh, doesn't mean they shouldn't get any attention. Usually they need to be baseline shifted up or down or adjusted in their weight or stroked, uh, spaced a little bit more generously so that uh, they, you know, maintain an even rhythm with their surrounding text, but are very, very clearly some uh, a kind of a differentiator. They're there for a purpose uh, to be called out uh, to a certain degree. Uh, and then last is, you know, your mark, quotation marks and apostrophes. You always want to make sure that you're setting the actual quotations or apostrophes uh, that are designed for that typeface and not uh, resorting as a default to the hash marks, which should only be used for inch and foot measurements. answer for those people that can stay. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about me, if you're interested in any of my books, you can find uh, information both at my website and also at that of my publisher. And the links are provided on the lower left. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to you, Amanda. Hi, so thank you so much, Timothy, for taking time. Uh, and I know that we are a little over time. However, we do have some questions for you. Hopefully, you can Great. answer some. Uh, so our first question is, it said that serif typefaces are easier to read for body copy. 
Are there empirical studies to back this up? Uh, yes, there are, and that actually used to be true before 1990. Uh, there was a group uh, in, uh, I believe it's upstate New York, called Laubach Literacy International uh, that released uh, a study uh, that said that because of the increasing uh, sort of prevalence uh, and ubiquity of sans serif text, that at around 1990 and possibly before that, uh, is that sans serif body copy in essence became more comfortably legible than serif text. Uh, this kind of goes back, there's a, a famous quotation by Zuzana Licko uh, of Emigre magazine um, who, who, who said basically, you know, we, we read best what we read most. Uh, and just because, uh, you know, sort of st uh, notions of, uh, you know, sort of stylistic, um, you know, how aesthetics change over time, uh, you know, over the course of the 20th century, uh, especially in the latter half, is that sans serifs became, uh, began to become more ubiquitous. Uh, and so it's generally uh, considered among most typographers now that in theory, uh, sans serif text faces uh, are more legible um, from baseline. The much larger X height, much op more open counters that contribute to being uh, to clearer character recognition. They don't necessarily hold the line as uh, readily or direct the eye through the line as rapidly as serifs do, simply because the serif element reinforces that horizontality. Uh, but its other uh, their other characteristics tend to lend to uh, greater legibility. Of course, all things are contextual. So uh, depending on the size of the text, depending on how much interline space, depending on the width of the paragraph or column, uh, even the overall internal spacing, all of those things can be adjusted. Great. Okay, so our next question is related to something you've already touched upon in your presentation. Uh, so the question is, do you have any tips on how to combine typefaces? And on a related note, how can you avoid the paralyzing problem of having too many font choices? Um, well, I can, I can tell you that the, the, the answer to the second question is the easier one, and that is just uh, to exercise some restraint, <laughs> is to purposely limit yourself. Is one, choose a font family that you know uh, is, you know, has a track record, uh, you know, a workhorse, uh, you know, something that has been kind of uniformly or conventionally established uh, as being a well-drawn face that is useful for text as well as display applications, uh, and then generally that has some variations within it, a light, a medium, a bold, and italics at the very least. That's plenty of stylistic variation to be able to create a whole lot of uh, contrast and typographic color and rhythm changes. Um, so that, on the other hand, there's really no, there's no easy way, uh, there's no easy answer to the, you know, how many typefaces should I use and when, um, you know, how do you, how do you combine them? Uh, you know, if you need, if you need 27 different typefaces uh, for one reason or another, it could be an exceptionally deep and complex hierarchy. It could be uh, it could be something conceptual or something uh, you know, sort of metaphorical that you're after, a certain kind of, of texture, then so be it. Um, uh, but usually you're looking for, you know, uh, educators generally tell their students, you know, pick two type families uh, or two type styles. And when they say type style, they usually mean family. Um, and that's usually just a kind of a way of making sure that students don't go out of control because they tend to think like, oh, if I mix like 10 type styles together, I'll have this really interesting thing. And it usually becomes a kind of a mess. You have to look at uh, and really sort of appreciate uh, the various, the formal uh, and structural characteristics of the typefaces that you're looking at. As a, of course, you want contrast. So you're looking at weight, you're looking at relative sharpness or softness of the terminals uh, of the strokes, you're looking at overall body uh, proportion, you know, do you want something extended and something condensed? Um, and you can kind of mix and match those, you know, how many rules are there for what those relationships are? How many different relationships are there between the different type styles that you are combining together? You always want to make sure that you're choosing, you know, how many you're uh, working with based on, well, what's the purpose of each one? Every time you change a style, it's a signal to the reader that, 
something has changed in the information. And usually the thing that has changed is meaning uh, or relative importance. Uh, and so each time you create a stylistic change, you're suggesting that one kind of text is unlike the other kind of text in some way. Um, so you want to always sort of think about, you know, how are you using those, those different type styles to kind of code, uh, not just textiles that are alike in their meaning, but also textiles that are of similar importance overall, or that, perf that perform the same function. So titling and subheadings and uh, detailed notations within a diagram uh, all sort of serve the same function. That is that they kind of title or explain or set up an idea that's then supported by text or other information of a much de more detailed uh, level. So you have to sort of really look at the functionality of each kind of text element uh, and then determine, you know, really how complicated is the hierarchy. Uh, can you set uh, all of, you know, all text with one typeface and just simply change, you know, size? Yeah, sure. That's entirely possible. And so if you want to be really, really rigorous about it, and some of that is, is sometimes is, you know, about the designer's own sensibility or their own kind of aesthetic persona or their philosophy about how much and how little stylistic variation, you know, how eclectic or kind of rigorous something should be. And all those things are fine to take into account. Um, but I think that all those decisions really need to be made uh, from the standpoint of serving the information, uh, of making sure it is clear as possible, uh, that it is navigated uh, in the most easy way uh, by the reader, uh, and that it supports the kind of the sequential thinking that's embodied in the text uh, as it's been provided by the author. You know, ultimately, you know, whatever you want stylistically, you know, in theory is possible, uh, but uh, you're in service uh, to uh, two other uh, kind of entities. One is the author uh, who has, uh, you know, sort of worked to um, outline and build a kind of a sequence of thinking uh, that depends on those relationships. And then the other is the viewer, the reader, uh, who depends on those visual relationships in order to be able to understand the author's uh, sequence of thinking. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was very thorough. Okay, so our next question, do you have any comments on type for environmental graphics and signage and wayfinding? both to be functional, but also to look engaging and interesting? Well, engaging and interesting, I, I think, are, are kind of questions that I would rather not even consider because um, those are kind of stylistic. Uh, those are kind of stylistic questions. Any typeface can be engaging in any context. Um, but generally, you know, for signage, you're really looking for uh, character recognition, uh, especially at a distance and uh, in very, very complex environments. So the degree to which uh, that typeface's counters are, are open, uh, the relative sharpness and sort of decisive quality uh, of how the terminals end um, are really, really kind of critical. And it's sort of, again, this goes back to the sort of the legibility issue um, and, 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 you know, the sort of question of, well, serif or sans serif. And you'll notice that most most uh, signage systems, most environmental wayfinding tends uh, to kind of over, uh, I shouldn't say over represent, or tends to be represented by sans serif faces, um, especially road signs and so on. And that's because you're looking for kind of minimal detailing um, and very, very open counter. So generally it, it, it seems to turn out that regular to lighter weights uh, in that particular family uh, will tend to open up the counter spaces more and sort of reveal the joints between letters more clearly. Uh, you'll generally find that monoline or uh, typefaces with limited contrast between thick and thin uh, also simplify uh, the you know the act of character recognition and create you know sort of one level of contrast against whatever the background or substrate is, um, as opposed to a serif which may have, you know, because it has thins and thicks, uh, is likely to create two or three different levels of contrast because of the detailing within it. Great, and another question that came in, could you comment on the value of using lines and dots of varying sizes and tonal value to represent type when creating a typographic composition? 
I think that's a, a fine thing, even, even as a as a kind of uh, as a kind of way of generating a, a kind of a compositional sense, uh, not just of of the shaping of the type elements, but uh, for their texture, their relative lightness and darkness. Uh, I think really valuable, um, and I do it myself sometimes. Uh, this is the thing about type that contributes to designers getting really confused about it is that we're constantly reading the text as we start to get hung up on what the words say and you know which of course we have to and sometimes that prevents us from being able to look at the kind of the big picture of overall layout and just sort of define in a kind of a loose and intuitive and sort of fresh way well where is stuff and how big is it and what is you know what is it doing in this space uh, and I, I have my students do this all the time to say you know kind of like map uh, or, or kind of reproduce uh, the text elements that you're working with just as lines or dots um, or you know even sometimes squares which uh, or rectangles which can be a little bit you know kind of extreme um, and sometimes I have them do it with uh, you know sort of gestural drawing you know with a paintbrush um, which brings it even further away from the geometric quality is just to find like you know is this a beautiful composition or not uh, and what's the logic of that composition, you know, space and positive negative interplay and what kind of structure and so on. And then put the type back in, replacing those elements with the ones that you're you know, kind of keeping in your mind relate to each of those kinds of things. The bigger and bolder marks or lines, you know, this is where the headline goes. And this little, this little rectangle of really, really thin textural lines, this is where the body copy goes. And then you sort of have to look at it and say, you know, well, does that actually make sense? Uh, and then you make some adjustments, but it's a really nice way of getting, you know, kind of to the to the visual quality of it and becoming familiar with um, with the purely visual aspects of typography. Uh, and eventually, you know, you don't need to do that anymore because your intellectual mind and your intuitive mind, the visual mind, kind of functions simultaneously. It becomes second nature. Great, thank you. And so. Uh, in designing a typeface or hand lettering for a project, what's the number one thing that will make it terrible? What should you avoid? Uh, what should you avoid? Uh, this this uh, subject matter will be dealt in great depth uh, in my upcoming book, uh, Letter Forms. You see the cover. <coughs> Excuse me. You see the cover there on the upper left. It should be out in June. Um, th there, there are two things that you really want to avoid. One is irregularity in overall character width, um, which is a, a, you know, it's a sticky wicket because every character uh, is a different shape. It's got different kinds of elements, uh, angle forms, diagonal forms, curve forms, sometimes in combination, and the spaces inside them therefore become kind of different in shape. There's a whole lot of push me, pull you kind of optical, uh, optical compensation that has to go on. But basically you're after regularity in, in rhythm. Uh, and there, and so the first thing that you want to look for is that the characters, regardless of their individual shapes, seem, appear, look like they're the same overall width. That is, that their basic strokes are the same, are equidistant from each other, uh, both within the letters and between letters, and then between the ends of words and so on. Um, and the second is is str uh, stroke weight. Uh, because of the history of how letter forms, uh, at least the Western alphabet, was developed, we expect, uh, and it's only considered good, if you want to use that word, such a loaded term, when the weights of the strokes are uh, distributed in certain ways. And if you, you know, blow up any typeface really large, and you'll find that all of the vertical strokes are heavy, all of the horizontal strokes are light in weight, all of the diagonals that uh, fall from top to bottom or are kind of downstrokes, like on the right hand side of, an, uh, of a capital A, are always heavy. All the upstrokes, uh, that would be the left side of uh, a capital A, are always light. Uh, and the curve forms also follow that logic, is that as the curve is moving in the sort of the horizontal direction, at kind of cap line and baseline, uh, is that the stroke weight is light. And then as it transitions downward into the vertical, it becomes heavy again. And it's basically evidence of the brush. Um, brush, pen, chisel, uh, but not in that order. Um, and so usually uh, this is one of the kind of the details of, of lettering or, or typeface design that you know, people who haven't done it before aren't familiar with it. 
generally tend to overlook. Uh, and that happens even in sans serifs that appear, you know, in a text size to be uh, all the same weight. So, like one of the things that that you all should do, uh, if you don't believe me, uh, is uh, you know set a Helvetica capital uh, Helvetica regular capital E and blow it up so that it's about you know 10 points high, uh, and you'll find that you know when that letter form is only about 12 points in size or lower. Uh, is that all the strokes look like they're the same weight. Uh, but when you blow it up really big, it turns out that all the horizontal strokes are actually much lighter, thinner in weight than the vertical stem is. You'll also find out that all three of those strokes are different lengths, uh, and sometimes, depending on the typeface, really, really different in length. The middle, the middle crossbar on an E is always radically shorter than the other two. And these are tiny compensations uh, that account for what our eyes do with forms uh, based on their shape and their orientation in space. Great, and we have time for one last question, and I think nope. you've already touched upon this, uh, but it asks, uh, could you recommend techniques to simplify the process of constructing effective typographical layouts without getting paralyzed or sidetracked by virtually endless combinations of font, size, tonal value, etc.? Um, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, it is, it's, about, it's about purposeful limitation. Um, and because I'm, I'm notorious uh, among myself, uh, or within myself for being unable to make decisions because everything is interesting and visually engaging to me. Uh, so sometimes I will simply cut off, you know, 90% of all possible possible options just to focus myself. So I'll pick one typeface. I'll set everything at nine points. I'll make a four-column grid. Uh, and uh, you know, just in doing that, you realize very rapidly, like, okay, I'm going to need a little bit of variation here. But I think if you hamstring yourself a little bit, um, is that, you know, uh, necessity, as they say, is the mother of invention. And if you work within really, really strict limitations, you find ways of exploiting which options or qualities or possibilities that are left over uh, can be exploited to the greatest extent. And it makes you then very, very confident about getting as much out of as little as possible. And then when you see that you need a little bit of a texture change, you need a little bit of a letting change, you need a little bit of a weight change, then you, you add in a weight. Or you change, you, know, you change one particular kind of element like the titling to a serif or to the bolder weight or to another, you know, to a slab serif. Uh, and then you you know you allow a little bit of of uh, variation to kind of creep in, and then you you know you decide. Uh, but I, I find it's very very helpful for me just to cut off possibilities, because uh, otherwise I would just push and pull stuff around and change the styles all over the uh, case. Okay. Sometimes I it's a limitation you know based on some kind of conceptual issue. Um, uh, the typographer and poet Robert Bringhurst, in particular, likes to say that you know a 15th century text, a 15th century text, uh, should be set in a 15th century typeface, uh, and that's an that's an interesting way of thinking about it that lends a certain kind of quality to that. Like, well, if I'm setting Shakespeare's sonnets, should I really be using Universe or Helvetica, or maybe I'll use you know Stag or Auto, or maybe I'll use a a script face. Um, and if you just say I'm going to use I'm going to use uh, you know Grandjean's Roman de Roi from you know, you know 1580 or so uh, because that's when Shakespeare was working. I mean you can think about it that way. There are other people that say you know I only use the universe family and nothing else, and that's a decision that they make, and that can be that can be a nice limitation. And I think it's a challenge uh, you know to you know, sort of heap on severe limitation. Uh, and then see, you know, exactly how far can you push uh, against that without actually breaking the rule. Wonderful. Okay, so I know we've run over time, but I'd like to thank Timothy for taking the time to present this content to us today and answering our questions. We really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me, and I hope that um, the presentation has been helpful for everyone.
Great. And so before we sign off, a quick reminder that RGD organizes regular free virtual events to our members. On March 1st, Elise Benin will speak about how to talk money with confidence and avoid the seven most lethal negotiating mistakes. And on March 8th, Sar Friedman will speak about improv design and how you are the owner of your tools as a designer. So visit rgd.ca for a full list of upcoming webinars and other events. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for your participation.